Hi there, it's Jonathan Herbst again, founder and CEO of um, Scale Up Growth. Welcome again to my business focus um, series where I chat with owners, manager directors, founders, and business leaders of scaling companies. It centers around their entrepreneurial journey so far and their aspirations for their companies. So today I'm really excited to, to talk to Renee Francis, who's founder and director of the Bubble Company, or Bubble Co. Bubble Co. Bubble Co. And recently, four months ago, launched a second business called Take Three. Um, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Jonathan, and thanks for the nice intro. I, I'm looking forward to our conversation. Yeah, likewise, likewise. Really? Tell me, um, so you've got two, two companies to talk about now. Yes. How long have you been doing it and what are the companies focused? Sure. So I'll start with the Bubble Co. So basically what we do with the Bubble Co is we help um, large national and multinational organizations um, basically crush it in the digital space by providing them with uh, resourcing for their marketing team and um, implementing all their digital marketing strategy uh, for them on an ongoing basis. And uh, we particularly tend to help clients that are, like I said, large national or multinationals in the B2B manufacturing, industrial, construction type space. And they benefit from our team's expertise and knowledge in the digital world um, for, for their businesses and their teams who are often pretty limited resource-wise uh, internally. Um, and then Take 3 is a dedicated web three agency. So we're actually helping clients uh, move into the new iteration of the internet uh, being web three. So everything around blockchain technology, um, NFTs, and uh, yeah, the new emerging technology that is uh, slowly but surely taking over all our lives. Okay. So I will try and work out how we scope the questions based around those quite two diverse um, complex. So how would you, uh, okay, um, how would you describe your core customer for each of them? Well, we know that we know um, the Bubble Co, large yep. nationals, inter, um, in, international yep. uh, um, marketing, marketing teams. What about um, Take Three? Sure. So Take Three, we have sort of three uh, sort of focus uh, customer personas, I guess you could call them. Uh, so the first one being Web3 founders and startups. So people that are Web3 natives and they are either they're starting uh, something in that space. So it could be an exchange, it could be an education company, uh, it could be a new protocol or a new application of blockchain technology, it could be an NFT collection. Um, so that would sort of sum up the, the first category. Um, the second category are, are similar, but they've, they're working in an established Web3 company and they've probably been around for a few years or at least a year because it's still a new space. Um, and thirdly, we're helping Web2 clients and obviously leveraging from our bubble crew clientele, uh, we're helping Web2 clients who are completely unfamiliar and a lot of the time unaware of Web3 technology, we're helping them move into the space and realize the benefits of it as well. So I have interviewed um, a number of um, CEOs who have worked in the Web3 space before, but I'm, I, I'm not sure that everybody is Every one of these interviews you should be, but um, let's just jump in a little bit and maybe I can do my view on what these things are. So an NFT is a non-fungible token. Yeah. It is essentially, well, you, tell me what an NFT is. Sure. So you, yeah, absolutely. You're on the right part there. So non-fungible token. So it's basically a digital asset. It's uh, unique and immutable uh, and it's a seal of authenticity is because it's stamped on the blockchain. Uh, and the blockchain, for those who are unfamiliar, is uh, basically a, a way of storing data in a really secure and irreversible way, basically, right? So um, an NFT, uh, its value is normally derived when it um, is attached to some real-world value or real-world utility. So as an example, think of it as um, a membership token. And this is just one example or one application on, of NFT technology where you've uh, got a membership and access to a community, a, a group that has lots of different benefits involved by being in that group. And you can only access that group and its benefits by holding one of the NFTs. Yep. So to put that into terminology that you know, 63 year old uh, retired CEO talks in, um, I'm, the, I'm, I'm a non-executive director for superannuation fund. Sure. Um, we are investigating using um, 
uh, blockchain to actually store yes. uh, um, the, um, the the investment um, of, of, our, of our clients. It's, it's something that is sweeping the world and something we need to look at. The Australian Stock Exchange is looking at um, holding shares in, 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 in the blockchain. Um, land titles offices around the world are looking at holding land titles in, in the blockchain. So um, it's uh, it is a, um, a very much a proven um, uh, technology, um, and yeah, unfortunately, it's, it's taken it's had a bit of a bad rap at times because of my person, my view, um, because of um, all that cryptocurrency. Um, but the underlying technology is extraordinary. Absolutely agree. We couldn't, couldn't agree with you more there. Um, the underlying technology is absolutely amazing. Um, you know, my introduction into blockchain and Web3 world was actually through cryptocurrency investing. So, yeah, fully agree with what you said there. It does get a bad rap because of its, its link to cryptocurrency. But more and more people are now starting to understand that uh, blockchain has much wider applications beyond cryptocurrency alone. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it's really exciting to see. And we're seeing, you mentioned a couple of them there, um, but we're seeing so many different applications on a daily basis. So, you know, for example, a lot of people will be familiar with DocuSign. So our way of signing documents online. Um, and there's a blockchain Web3 version of that um, called Quick Trust, where, you know, you can sign documents and then they're sealed and on the blockchain, right? So it, it's really exciting to see all the developments in the blockchain space beyond cryptocurrency. Um, and it just seems like it's going to become more and more adopted across businesses and many industries in the future. Mm. And, and I, do, I do definitely agree based on the research we, we're doing. <clears throat> So um, let's jump into more general stuff if we can. Sure. So you've been through um, uh, you've been through the pandemic like we all, all have. What were some of the actions you took as 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 a CEO during the pandemic that has stuck with the business going forward? Yeah, sure. Uh, good question. Oh, the pandemic. Uh, I'll you know just cast my mind back to that. It felt like it would never end at the time, and now it feels like it was so long ago. So it's interesting how how that all has played out. Um, but look, we are a fully remote team and we have been since uh, the beginning, since 2016. So in terms of our working operations, we were quite blessed in that we didn't need to uh, make radical changes uh, as we saw a lot of other businesses and some of our clients having to make. We were lucky that we were able to continue working remotely and we had you know, the software, the tools and everything in place. So that was nice. Um, one of the biggest actions I did implement in the business though was um, a lot more learning and education. So one thing I noticed during the pandemic is that unfortunately a lot of people were getting, you know, as we all did, but people were getting caught up in um, the news and the negativity of it all and uh, case numbers and, you know, things like that. And having a lot more time at home meant that people were either spending more time with the TV on um, you know, or, or, you know, watching different platforms. So one thing I implemented was um, basically I um, invested money into an online um, courseware. Um, so basically anyone in our team can jump online, access any course they want. Doesn't just need to be about marketing or business or blockchain or Web3. There are courses about uh, cooking or sports or all different types of things. And any one of our team members can jump online, can consume that content, which is more educational, more positive, more uplifting. They bring those learnings back into the business. We then hold knowledge share sessions amongst the team where um, we have sessions where that team member will then train or educate the others on what they've learned. Um, and we all use and implement, uh, you know, that, that kind of knowledge, which is really cool. So that's something that we've definitely continued that will remain part of the business, um, all different learning opportunities. Um, yeah, that's probably been one of the best things that's come out of it. Do you, um, do you put targets or KPIs on that? Uh, yeah, I know why you did it at the time, but now that you yes. can do you put targets or KPIs on on that for people to learn um, or for the organization to learn, to learn? And I'll give you an example. We, um, with my clients, I work on having a quarterly learning um, goal, I suppose, yep. uh, you know, the, the organization, my, my clients will deep dive into one book or one piece of learning each quarter. Yep. 
Yeah, absolutely. So each team member has um, their goals, professional and personal goals mapped out. So depending on each team member, what their goals are, aspirations, what their role is in the business, uh, we've got all that mapped out individually. Fabulous. Well done. So what does the future look like and what do you see as your, the key challenges going forward? Apart from the running to... to, to, to... <laughs> Yeah, look, what can I say? I love working. I love keeping busy. So um, two businesses is definitely fulfilling that. So uh, I get, think the first part of your question was, what does the future look like? Um, and what are the main challenges? Sure. So um, I definitely see, you know, with that, it goes without saying, I guess, but I definitely see more uh, businesses moving into the Web3 space, hence why, you know, Take3 now exists. Uh, and we're, you know, actively working with our Web2 Bubble Co clients to move into that space as well. We've just spoken about some, you know, applications of blockchain and it just makes so much sense. You know, so for example, in what I now call the traditional digital marketing world, so the digital marketing that we know now, uh, platforms like uh, Facebook and Meta um, have, you know, definitely deteriorated in the last year or two. There's, there's still good advertising platforms, but from where they used to be to now, there is a massive difference. And, you know, what I can see from that is, you know, when we post organic content, there's, you know, the engagement has just been decreasing and decreasing over time. And, you know, we can have Facebook groups and brands on there, but there's not real communities being created and not real engagement. And, you know, this is where Web3 comes in in terms of building real communities, um, you know, around things like an NFT collection, for example. Um, so, you know, I do see Web3 as improving and building upon and even fixing some of the issues that we've sort of encountered or even created in the Web2 world. So I do see that as a big, big part of our future uh, in the coming years. Um, and in terms of the main challenges, look, uh, where, where, where can I start? I mean, there are always different, um, you know, challenges, lessons um, in, in business, but one of the biggest things I probably see maybe even more in the shorter term, maybe this year is, you know, there's a lot of pressure coming for small businesses. Um, I guess, you know, over the last few years, there were a lot of, you know, um, government incentives, um, tax breaks, handouts and things like that. So for a lot of smaller businesses and particularly startups, there, there are potentially challenging times ahead um, in terms of, you know, the, the, the economy, um, you know, as well as, you know, just, just startups being able to, you know, uh, prove a profitable business, if that makes sense. So, you know, there was so much, you know, I, I read so much about how much money was, you know, raised for some startups in the last few years, money being thrown at, you know, wild and weird ideas. Uh, like I mentioned with the, the, you know, government either tax breaks or, or handouts and things like that. So I guess money was flowing a bit more and, you know, we're sort of seeing that where uh, things are tightening up this year. So, you know, a lot of those startups are going to face challenges if they're not turning a profit and not um, sort of having that revenue come in the door, um, not being able to rely on raising more funding and, and things like that. Yeah. yeah. You say that. I um, One of my clients, um, he personally recently uh, relocated he and his family to um, the US, uh, West Coast of the US, because you know, the business is just growing so much. But I was talking to him last week and he was just talking about um, you know, the impact of Silicon Valley Bank um, yeah, collapsing. And, um, you know, startup money has just drawn it up. Yeah. Um, he thinks it's a blip, but it's, you know, you know, what do they say? Cash is king. That's um, right. Is, That's right. Is the critical thing. And it's, um, yeah, and even, you know, down to the grants, uh, you know, I just followed my account. It's advice. You know, during COVID, so what we did, you know, sign the form, okay. <laughs> um, but uh, Mike got a letter from, uh, New South Wales government about two months ago, you know, please, can we have 26 grand of that back? It's like, oh, okay, that's fine. But um, luckily I run a business where I've got you know, a, a, a year's cash in the bank. Um, I've also, yeah. You know, a lot of companies are not in that position. So it's, uh, yeah, cash will always be. Um, absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, there's a lot of, um, you know, I saw a, a lot of, uh, startups maybe some that were a little bit more established as well just 
you know, you, you know, you can check out their social media and you can see the events they're throwing on the, you know, the travel that's happening. And I think a lot of that sort of lavish spending is going to really have to tighten up if some of these businesses aren't, um, you know, turning a profit and, um, you know, so just making sure the businesses are more sustainable, I guess. Well, yeah, and you know, there's a lot to be learned to learn from the past. Yeah, personally, really? it all than you. I've lived through three recessions, um, and uh, yeah, there's a lot to be learned from the past because you know it's exactly the same what's happening today. Mm. Um, probably, probably not as bad as you know 2008 and um, uh, 1989, but it's um, yeah, a very a lot of similarities out there. So, Tui, I'd like to explore the question a little bit more. So, you're running two companies. How are you? splitting your time it's a good question uh at the moment uh, i would say i'm kind of i'm splitting my time you know where the to what's needed basically so bubble club is more established um i've got a team of 16 people in place there um uh, amazing team um they're all superstars they know what they're doing uh, you know they you know so they keep the business running and turning on a daily basis uh, which is really helpful and uh take three probably it does need a lot more of, it needs a bit more of my time at the moment um you know while we're uh getting an established and it's a smaller team there so there are um six of us in total and so at the moment just while i'm four months in just while i'm getting that business um you know, uh, off, uh, off, you know, well structured, and um, you know, uh, uh, with the same, you know, systems and processes, you know, that have taken seven years to build in the Bubble Co. But while we're getting um, that all running smoothly, it is taking up, uh, you know, probably a little bit more of my time. But I think the most important thing of all of this is just having really good teams and really good people in place and people in their roles. Um, that's obviously uh, helping a lot. And the fact that Bubble Co has been operating for a much longer time. So if I had just started Bubble Co last year and then was trying to start this, I think that that would I would be setting myself up for a disaster. Um, but I've, I've given the Bubble Co uh, enough time to really like get established and and have stability. Yeah, it's um it's a difficult thing. Yeah, it's not... difficult. Yeah, yeah it's um. One of the ways I wrote a blog about it not long ago, um, uh, theming days um, is a, a great way of doing things, and also um, uh, yeah, time blocking. So time blocking, uh, time yeah. specifically each week for specific you know, deep dives into you know, team teams, etc., and, and projects, but also theming. Um, yeah, one of the one of the issues that I find with all of my clients, all of my entrepreneur clients, is that they're not good at um, allocating time, mm. and they're certainly not good at allocating time to themselves and their families. Um, so, you know, my, I was talking to a client just a moment ago. Yeah, I theme my week on the basis of Monday is um, all focus internally. So, well, sorry, marketing, lead gen, um, uh, team meetings, um, yeah, one on ones, um, yeah. deep dives, all of that happens Monday. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday is my um, uh, coaching and my interview times. Uh, these interviews, um, yeah, really the coaching, particularly the yeah where the income gener is generated from, and, and my team models this by the way. And then Friday up until midday is um, uh, is yeah, deep dive into whatever strategy aspect I need to deep dive into, and then Friday afternoon I try and take off um, sure. because you know. But by locking that stuff into the diary and having my, my having my um, all of my team and my clients know that. Um, beyond the value for my clients all the time, but you know, generally they they um, know and understand it and it works out really well. Yeah, that's good. I mean, the time blocking thing, I, I didn't touch on it, but it is something I'm still practicing. I'm still, I'm getting better at it. Um, and it doesn't work every week because I'm still new at it, but it definitely does help. And I'm similar to you in that I try to try to schedule most of my meetings towards the beginning of the week. So Mondays are normally like jam packed with meetings, Tuesday and Wednesday is, you know, in a sense, and then, um, try to, you know, uh, free up a little bit of time towards the end of the week to, you know, get some work done, catch up on things. Um, but it's definitely, 
uh, it's definitely a work in progress. I haven't, I haven't mastered the, uh, the juggling of time just yet. It's, uh, I am working on it. I'm actively working on it. Uh, but also I, um, I thrive on being busy. So in a sense, it, it kind of keeps me fulfilled at the same time. <laughs> you have children. I don't have children. That's probably <laughs> what allows me to do this at the moment. <laughs> just... I mean, it's funny. I, I, I don't know if you've noticed, I've been um, just glassing back. But um, yeah, one of those things in COVID that I did, um, uh, I live in Barrel, which is about an hour and a half southwest yeah. of Sydney. And Beautiful you know, pose. I love Barrel. It is. But you know, I, you know, I was doing a lot of coaching online anyway. Um, so the transition was easy. Um, but yeah, in COVID, I think I had. Yeah, eight and nine now, so they would have been what four and five or five and six, and um, uh, we ended up, uh, you know, working from home just didn't work. Sure, uh, and Fair enough. by chance, so like you know, I'd been lucky the door, uh, the house next door came up, and it was an absolute bargain, and we grabbed that, and so I I did next door, my own, my office is in the house next door, and the kids come home after school here, so that I was glad to because the kids come in and say hi, Dad. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah, well, makes sense. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great way of you know, time blocking. You know, at the end of this, this interview, I handled um, the, the process away to my team. Yes. And um, I have time with my, with, my, with my kids and make sure they've eaten their lunch. Yeah. Their lunch. Yeah. Perfect. Well, that works out well. Yeah. But time block. And it, you know, I find it, um, yeah, it works. It, that and theming the days. Um, I really do rely on, and it gives, but it gives certainty to the teams and to the clients as well. That's true. And the thing I'll add to that as well is making sure that I have scheduled some me time every day. So mm. I, I used to wake up and start working and I tend to wake up early. So I might be on, you know, my laptop, you know, five, six, you know, before 7 a.m., right? Yeah. And this is years ago now, right? And I realized it wasn't quite healthy. So I would get up and I'll do a couple of hours of work early in the morning. And then I would like go to a gym class or go do some exercise uh, in that mid morning and then uh, come back and, you know, work from lunch. And then what I started to realize was, well, if I do that, I've sent off all my emails in the morning, then I go off and then everyone's replying to me in the afternoon. And then I'm sort of like stuck on my laptop till, you know, right into the evening and not replying to everybody and getting everything done. So I was actually like instigating that behavior because I was emailing so early. That's right. So I changed my timetable around and now I wake up and my first few hours of the day are waking up, uh, either reading, um, you know, I, I, you know, I do like, I express gratitude. I go into some exercise and that normally consists of either going to the gym and doing a gym session or doing a, uh, kickboxing. And uh, one of those with some walking and I listen to a podcast as I'm walking and, uh, you know, I have my breakfast and I do all those things that I want to do for myself in the morning. And then I'm normally sitting down ready at my desk to start working by nine. And I felt that that was, that has been, has been so much healthier for me. And it means that. And for your team. And for my team as well, and and for clients as well, because like I said, I was sending off emails, and then people were responding to me later. But if I was if I was going to be sitting at my um, desk or on my computer or responding to people later, I don't need to be emailing them early in the morning. So I had to kind of retrain myself in the early years of the business. I think it's really it's really healthy, and um, and this is essentially what you're talking about is your time block. Oh, uh, listen, yes. So uh, yeah, I highly recommend. I will send you. I've just finished on meetings, agendas, planning a CEO's week, et cetera, when we finished. And if anybody who's listening would like it, just email me and I'll, I'll send it out to you. That's great. I'd love to check that out. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, what are you? I forgot what question we're at. That was challenges. Yes. Okay. Biggest learning since you've been a business, business owner? Biggest learning... Um, I will start by saying I've learned so much about myself. Uh, I, I don't know if, if, if that's where you want me to take the question yeah. or the answer. Wherever you want to go. Um, I've learned so much about myself, um, in learning how to lead people. Um, you know, 
you know, and, and just the, the difference between uh, sort of like leading and managing and, you know, controlling people in a way like, you know, leadership has been so different and I'm constantly learning and growing and evolving every day. And then there's that little added challenge of leading a remote team as well with, with team members, you know, all over Australia and we've even got one in New Zealand. So, uh, yeah, I, I just, you know, I just think as a person, um, I've, I've grown so much over the last few years. I mean, I could go into all the little nitty gritty things that I've learned, but I think like if I wanted to kind of sum that up and, and keep this relatively sure, I, I've, I've learned, I've learned a lot about myself and I've grown as a, as a human being and I've grown as a person. Um, and one other thing that I, I do sort of want to touch on is I've learned that there is opportunity everywhere. So, you know, we touched on earlier about the pandemic and COVID and we've spoken about, um, you know, the potential for, you know, uh, cash flow and, you know, you know, businesses and sustainability. And I think even in, in times like this, where things might seem a little more challenging, I think there's just opportunities to be found everywhere and running a business and now to, has really opened my eyes up to that. You know, we, we are born and, and we we grow up and we're conditioned as as children in a way that um you know you go to school and you learn and you study and then you get a job and we're kind of conditioned and taught well at least i was so i can only speak from my experience you know that that's what school kind of taught us that okay and then you get a job and then you you know you do that for the next 20 30 40 years right yeah. and from running a business i've learned that there was so many more opportunities and so many more ways of living life than, than that. Um, so, you know, you can run a business, you know, as an entrepreneur, uh, you can be an intrapreneur where, you know, you work with, or you work under someone else's business, but then you, you know, you gain share of that, um, company, you can, um, invest in other businesses, you can, uh, give people own it, like part ownership of your business or, you know, growth or profit shares. Like there are just so many different ways of doing things that we're probably, and like I said, or I wasn't educated so much, um, you know, growing up and going through the school system. So it's really opened my eyes up to, you know, just opportunity and lots of ways of doing things. Look, you know, I totally agree. And you know, the thing that s struck me that um, when you're talking just there was the word acquisitions. Um, yeah. I'm working with a number of my clients right now. Yeah, we're we're in a stage where um, uh, a lot of the baby boomers are looking to retire, or one they had been for a number of years now, um, because yeah. over they haven't been able to, um, and they're getting a bit desperate. And there are some really interesting acquisition um, deals out there. Um, uh, if you look, uh, and um, yeah, even self funding. Um, so, as you say, the opportunities <clears throat> certainly there. It's just go, you know, working out what it is, what's the one big thing you want to achieve and going for it. That's right, exactly. When you think of the word successful, who's the first, that come, uh, first person that comes to mind and why? Oh, to pinpoint it to one person, um, that's, that's a, uh, what was that, Jonathan? <laughs> you can name two. Oh, I can name two. Um, it, uh, to be honest, you know, when I think of a successful person, I just think of someone who is sort of, you know, living life on their own terms and, 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 and happy as well. Like they've got a, you know, a sense of happiness and, and gratitude uh, towards life and what's given them. Um, so to pinpoint us to one person is really difficult because honestly, and also a lot of the people, you know, that I uh, might see online. You know, I don't actually have, you know, personal connection with, so I can't, I, I can't really determine if they are as successful as they might come across online. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, but to me, success is just, yeah, someone living life on their own terms, someone who has, uh, lots of choice and flexibility and, um, is happy and, and grateful. That's a great answer. <laughs> that really is a great answer. Um, cause you know, there's this thing of work yourself into the ground and, um, uh, I'm not suggesting for CEO, there's, there's such a thing as, um, work-life balance cause there, there isn't, um, 
But it's interesting some of the things you you, you brought out through through is you know taking care of yourself. You know, grateful gratefulness is 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 critical. Um, you know, uh, I'm very aware um, with my life that I don't give I don't give enough time for me. Mm. Uh, you know, I focus on um, some the shadows, the sun's just coming. Oh, that's okay. Uh, uh, I give heaps of time to my family, heaps of time to my children, loads of time to my businesses. Um, but me, actually, me, it's um, it's and and connecting with other people outside of businesses is something that's one of my goals for this year. That's right. That's actually important, an amazing goal, and good on mm-hmm. you because I totally resonate with that. And I, I wonder sometimes if it's you know a challenge for a lot of entrepreneurs and a lot of business owners is you know, yeah. tend to be yeah. like. Givens, if I think the most entrepreneurs tend to have some form of ADHD. <laughs> because I oh, honestly, I can resonate so much. Uh, you know, mm. if it's um, if it's for somebody else, or you know, like you said, your family or your partner, you know, you jump at it. But if it's taking time for myself, sometimes to have a day off or go get, you know, the one thing I give myself every day is my exercise and my health because I think yeah, it's extremely great. important. Right. Um, but it's a really, really and and. Connecting with those old friends that you know, it's the last two visitors to see, and it's 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 so important. Absolutely. Hmm. Okay, books, podcasts, autobiographies, any you'd recommend? Yeah, books. I mean, if I took off this uh, background, you would see two massive bookshelves behind me. Um, yeah. I do love reading. Uh, I think you mentioned it earlier. I don't always get time, like a lot of entrepreneurs, but I squeeze it in. Um, my sort of top three business books would be Influence by Robert Cialdini. Um, How to Win Friends and Influence People is always a good one. Yep. And probably Pitch Anything is another good one. So, who's that by? Uh, Pitch Anything, I'm just having a look, is by, uh, I can't see it from here. That's right. All in Cluffs, I think it says. Yeah. Yeah. So they're really three good books that have helped me and impacted me a lot. Um, in terms of podcasts, um, Diary of a CEO, Stephen Bartlett, always get lots out of that. And he talks to such a wide range of people, but there's always something good to take out of his conversations. Um, Cub, Club of United Business, Daniel Hakim. Yep. It's a good one. I actually have an episode on that from last year. Okay. Yep, that's a really good one. Um, learned a lot there too. And probably Startup Diaries, uh, Kyle Trainer. So that's a really good one for business owners as well. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, a book, book to throw back, back at you, which I uh, is front of mind and mind because I'm, I'm working with a client team to work on it. Um, if you haven't seen it, Uncommon Service. Okay. Is that a uh, podcast? No, no, it's a book. It's a book. Uncommon, uh, Uncommon yeah. Service. By Francis Frey, F R E I. Okay, cool. I'm just uh, writing that down. Uncommon service by Francis Frey. Essentially, the concept, and uh, she she is the person that came up with the concept. I don't, I don't know if you've heard the term of attribution mapping or attribute mapping. You're mapping um, yourself versus um, your customers based on what the attributes in the market are, and finding a white space, you know, where you can dominate. Sure. Um, uh, so she came up with the concept of, of attribute ma- mapping, but um, yeah, one of the key things in there is um, you can't do everything. You know, you, to be excellent at something in service, you've actually got to be not good at something else. And how you made that decision is a really, it, um, yeah, it's a di- very difficult decision to make. Um, but so I, 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 I use it all the time, I it just because it's full time of mine, because I'm running an exercise tomorrow with client client team. It's um. So well worth having a look at. Yeah, absolutely. I've I've written that down, so I will. Um, and if you um, if you ever want any any books, unlike you, I've got three bookcases behind me. I'm <laughs> exactly the things everywhere. So, last question: any last piece of advice or parting words for entrepreneurs or aspiring entrepreneurs out there? Yeah, sure. For aspiring entrepreneurs, I always say like just take the leap. Uh, I myself, I I hesitated and I held back for a little while. I kept thinking that the universe was telling me I wasn't ready yet and I kept working in jobs that didn't make me happy. Um, But my advice is, you know, you've just got to take the leap. Obviously, you know, do it in a smart and considered way. Like maybe, you know, have some, you know, financial 
you know, savings and things like that. But um, yeah, don't, don't um, hesitate. And, you know, you've got to, you've got to sort of drop all the distractions and all the safety nets around you and really go for it. So when I, uh, you know, dropped my full-time job, I realized that I, I just went at it so much, you know, harder and with so much more hunger and because I realized that if I didn't make it now for myself, well, no one was coming to save me, right? So your whole mindset shifts or, or minds it at least. And yep. um, yeah, you, you just, you make it work because you have to. And um, so I'm always encouraging people who have been thinking about it, dabbling about it, dipping their toe in, you know, just, just, you know, just go for it, take the leap. Um, and what's the worst that can happen, right? The worst that can happen is, okay, maybe the first business didn't work out, but maybe your second or third will, or maybe the first isn't business didn't work out. Okay. You can just go get a job again for a little while. Like, especially in Australia, we live in a country with loads of opportunity. So, um, yeah, just take the leap and, and go for it. It's great advice. Um, and my first one didn't work out. I launched back in the year 2000, I launched a, um, a business called Alumni, um, Alumni Connect, which was my version of Facebook. Oh, okay. Um, and um, before Facebook launched. And unfortunately, when I actually watched the movie of Facebook, I realized what I did wrong. Oh, really? I was about to ask you, did you realize where it went wrong? So that's cool. Yeah, that absolutely. You, you know, um, Zuckerberg uh, left it until a long time down the track before he, uh, before he commercialized it. Um, where I tried to specialize it on day one. And, oh. uh, uh, and it's, yeah, it was like, ah, okay, but that's probably why he's a multi billionaire and I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> hey, look, at least you found the learning and the lesson in it, right? <laughs> well, uh, it's probably 57 years of looking, though, you know, <laughs> doing the thing that I love more than anything, anything I've done in the world, which is you know, talking to people like you and coaching people like him. Sure. Yeah. But I, thank you so much. It's been a fabulous conversation. Uh, thank you. I really enjoyed that. Um, yeah, it was really good to chat to you too. Excellent. And look, I mean, my life on my journey was um, connection. I really need to organise a drink um, one day for all of you, um, try and get us all together. Yeah, that would be amazing. Uh, it's always good talking to other like business owners and entrepreneurs, like-minded people. Well, and that's why we're doing it. That's why I'm doing this. Listen, thank you so much. Thanks, Jonathan. Thanks.